Today's uh, suicide attack also comes as Iran increases its involvement in the regional conflicts. And many of these conflicts, especially in Yemen, Iran and Saudi Arabia, find themselves in opposite sides. Elie Hochenberg looks at Iran's increasing involvement in the Middle East. Since the signing of the groundbreaking nuclear agreement between Iran and world powers last month, one dominant theme has been the impending opening up of Tehran to the world, and the latest headlines are trumpeting the first official arms sale between China and the Islamic Republic. But under the surface, things are changing not only in Tehran or with respect to its links to Washington and other Western capitals, but on the battlefields of the bloodiest conflicts of the Middle East. We intend to build an even stronger, more enduring, and more strategic partnership with particular focus on our cooperative counterterrorism, uh, counterinsurgency, and also on our uh, cooperation in countering the destabilizing activities taking place in the region. After long months of brutal fighting all across Yemen, in recent weeks there's been a clear positive momentum for the Saudi-backed forces supporting President Abu Rabu Mansour Hadi over the Houthi rebels who are supported by Tehran. Boosted by Saudi-led airstrikes, the military gains began with the pro-government fighters pushing Houthi rebels out of the port city of Aden last month, where now deposed President Hadi seeks to re-establish his base. It continued this Monday when the forces pushed north and recaptured the El Anad Air Base. On Tuesday, the victories kept on coming, with the fighters seizing about 10 southern villages from Houthi forces. If that's not enough to realize that things are shifting, after reports of a thousand of Yemeni fighters trained in Saudi Arabia and arriving back in Yemen earlier this week, now, Yemeni military sources said the United Arab Emirates had sent dozens of tanks and heavy artillery pieces to the fighters. Not by the U.S., not by the EU, not by the U.N., and not even by the JCC. Will the Syria civil war be solved by Iran? On Wednesday, the Iranian deputy foreign minister announced that Tehran will soon present the United Nations with a peace plan for Syria. Based on a four-point initiative already presented last year by Foreign Minister Muhammad Javad Zarif. Meanwhile, on the ground, Syrian government forces, backed by members of Lebanon's Shiite Hezbollah group, Iran's main regional proxy, advanced Wednesday from different directions in the mountain resort of Zabadani near the border with Lebanon, and on Sunday, they've made some territorial gains in the area near Latakia province. We are in a fateful period where there is no room for half majors. We will not be slaves, but independent masters. Nearly one year after the U.S.-led coalition started airstrikes against the Islamic State group, Ankara decided to join in a major policy change after years of reluctance to take a frontline role against the Islamic fighters pressing on its borders. Only on Wednesday, the United States has conducted its first drone strike into northern Syria from a base in Turkey, ahead of what Ankara said would soon be a comprehensive battle against Islamic State militants there. Different rationale or reasoning can be found for all these recent regional changes, but there is one bright shining similarity, Tehran. Or as the old phrase goes, it's hard to believe in coincidence, but it's even harder to believe in anything else. And with me now to discuss this is uh, Iranian politics analyst Mayor Javid Athar. Good, Good evening, Lucy. And also diplomatic correspondent for the news today, Elie Good, Good evening, evening Just today we heard uh, some uh, analysts and uh, security officials are saying in the United States that the Iranian deal and that Iran is already, um, let's say, uh, breaking the deal with them. Um, should the United States trust, should the world trust that maybe Benjamin Netanyahu at the end of the day is right, maybe? Well, the reports that they have is that Iran was apparently, according to the IAEA and foreign reports, Iran was carrying out some uh, military testing related to its nuclear program as part of the military nuclear program. So they have been trying to remove sample. But you see, the thing with uranium is that the half-life half, half -life of uranium is a couple of hundred billion years. I think it's like 300 billion years. So they're trying to remove all this soil. And so, you know, can, 
can they remove everything? Well, if they're doing it up until now, they're worried that they haven't been able to. The good, the good thing about that is that it shows that they believe that the IAEA is serious. IAEA is not just going to do some, you know, very artif very shallow uh, testing on this and just, just to, to give Iran a pass grade. But on the other hand, is Iran breaking? It, Iran's not breaking the deal by trying to uh, by trying to remove soil samples, but it is attracting a lot of attention, and it makes Especially it now, now now it makes it more difficult for the IAEA just to give Iran a pass grade just so. That that this this whole question is finished and we can move on. But you know, Lucy, you've you've asked if uh, can, if the U.S. can trust Iran. But I think that a symbolic shift in the in the rhetoric uh, can be seen in uh, one of uh, uh, the latest interviews of uh, U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry, if I'm not mistaken, to Jeffrey Goldberg uh, at the Atlantic, uh, uh, during which he said that uh, if uh, Congress will uh, not uh, approve the deal, it will make the Iranian not trust the U.S. So I think that this is a very you know. Uh, an interesting uh, uh, wording to use that Iran is the one to trust or not trust the West at this point uh, in time. You know, although that the United States uh, is finding itself in an opposite position in front of Iran in a lot of cases, uh, the United St States did not sign a deal with Iran about, like we said before, educating Iran about the involvement of Iran in the Middle East, about the fact that Iran is financing terror uh, groups. That was not not the deal. It is true, but but referring to the same interview that Ellie is talking about, Jeffrey Goldberg with uh, John Kerry. Apparently, John Kerry was told by Javad Zarif, the former the, the, the foreign minister, the current foreign minister of Iran, that if this deal goes through, Iran is prepared for more cooperation in this region. And one of the areas that Iran wants to cooperate is fighting against ISIS. Well. The Turkish are probably stealing their thunder right mm -hmm. now, because by Turkey cracking down against ISIS, Turkey is showing Iran that if you really want to fight ISIS, people need to talk to us more than anybody else. So it seems that Kerry doesn't want to close that door just to test the Iranians out to see if they're interested or not. So ex explain to me, please, the, the stanger that is happening with Syria. Because at the beginning, uh, we heard the United States uh, talking about the fact that uh, Bashar Assad should be removed from his position, that he is committing war crimes, crimes against humanity. Then we heard John Kerry taking a step back, saying maybe we should find a way to speak with Assad. Was that also part of the deal with Iran, because Iran is interested that Bashar, uh, Bashar al-Assad will stay in his position? Well, position? as we've seen in the report, there are many uh, regional ramifications of the Iran deal. Some of them we're more aware of, some of them we are not yet aware of, but definitely things are changing. We can see it in three main uh, locations, in Yemen, in Syria, and uh, renewed uh, Turkish involvement in the eight anti-terrorism uh, agenda, and this is uh, also a very interesting thing that the anti-terrorism agenda is uh, is uh, is being used to in favor of the interest of uh, countries like Iran, like Russia, uh, because that means that they can uh, uh, they can pursue their case that the best thing for the region to stabilize their region is to keep uh, Bashar al-Assad uh, uh, in in rule, and for Russia, it's a great way to get back into the uh, influence uh, here. In in the region. So I think that the anti-terrorism agenda is now being used for foreign interests. Some of them, of course, they involve uh, Iran and the nuclear it's, deal. Yeah, you know, there's no question that Bashar is the, Assad is a butcher, he's a murderer, he's used chemical weapons, he's terrible. Let me ask you a question. Do you think many people don't want Gaddafi to have don't, don't wish that he would have stayed in power mm -hmm. now, considering what happened That's in exactly Libya? What happened so I yes. think some or people Saddam are Hussein, some people are probably looking at, at, at Assad and thinking, hmm, do we want a Libya on our on our on our doorstep? And this includes the state of Israel. I mean. I'm assuming people are thinking that way. I think that if you were so, to ask uh, Israeli officials if they uh, would they like, have like they rather being, uh, yeah. have Assad or Assad being removed after what is happening in the Middle East, so, so certainly they will prefer Assad. So as terrible as he is, and as much as he must be punished for what he's done, if you want to play real politic here, you know, real politic, it's. So if there is an agreement that keeps him in power, so that at least part of the country is stable and is not run by these 
crazy ISIS people or others. And at the same time, there is an election process, then everybody wins. Why? On the one hand, you have the security that Assad gives you. And on the other hand, the election process will empower the moderates. Because let's face it, ISIS is not going to exactly run yeah. on an election ticket, are they? So, you know, this is now, I think, being seen more and more on the, as a realistic option. The question, I think, regarding Syria is that will the opposition agree? Will they, will they give up on the precondition that Assad must go? I think they have, but we have to see what they'll say. But it's amazing to see how quick Iran got back to business in controlling the, the politics here, uh, pushing an initiative to the UN regarding the Syria the Syria crisis. So it was a very, very because shift, uh, you know, it's coming back. It's not going back. well for them. It's not going well. The Syria is not. But the fact that Bashar al-Assad is now coming up publicly saying, look, yeah. I can't control the all of the country. We have to re-strategize and defend where we can. Look, the Iranians are worried. And how much, uh, let's say, uh, the involvement of Russia and how much Russia is involved in all this business is going maybe to anger the Americans uh, after the deal. I think there were, I think any any involvement of Russia in order to fight ISIS is welcomed. I think the Americans want Russia to to join them in the war against ISIS. It really depends. Look, Russia and America don't have that much point of contention anymore because we have a, it. Looks like we have a deal with Iran, uh, Congress willing, uh, and uh, and you know I think America and Russia actually have now a lot more common, especially in terms of fighting groups such as ISIS. In terms of Syria, again, this is just reports in the press. Some people saying the Russians are giving up on Assad are, and are looking for a long-term solution. And other reports indicate that Russia is mediating between uh, Riyadh to Syria to try and and, uh, and get some, you know, more general support in the region. I think that the Iran and, uh, and Russia's interest in the region are now obviously increasing by the second. And the fact that the Americans are very, uh, you know, frustrated with what's going on here, giving them space to be more active, while the Gulf area is uh, pretty much, you know, also uh, terrified with what's going on because they need to readjust to the current situation. So all the world powers are now, you know, taking a step uh, back and re-strategizing everything. The only red flag here is if Iran and Hezbollah stop building on our border with Syria. Mm -hmm. That's where it could lead to conflict. And at the same time, everybody's running to Tehran to do some business, which is good for the Iranian people. Ah, uh, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Businessman. Why well, you're skeptical? <laughs> Thank you very much for uh, being with me uh, here. We're going out for a small break, two minutes, and I'll be back for the second part of the news today. Don't go anywhere.